AMD has made an impressive resurgence in the CPU market over the past two to three years. And although they've been around for roughly as long as Intel, they didn't actually enter the consumer CPU market until the late 70s. And ever since, they've been trading blows with their competitors on multiple fronts, with some delivering powerful, industry-shaking blows, and others, well, they tried. However, I'm sure we can all universally agree that AMD's Zen CPU microarchitecture is at least mostly responsible for the resurgence we've seen from AMD in the recent years. And while Zen, Zen Plus, and Zen 2 based chips are excellent value processors, in the years before, we had a little something called the FX series of CPUs, which was laser focused on taking as much market share in the budget consumer space as possible. However, if you've ever owned one of these legendary CPUs, you'll know that today they're really struggling to keep up with modern quad-core Zen chips released over two years ago. So then, what's holding these chips back from taking the budget gaming crown? And what did AMD learn from their mistakes on what was supposed to be a revolutionary new design philosophy? Before I get into this video, I want to say that my YouTube analytics shows that only 4.2% of my total viewership is subscribed to this channel. If you enjoy this video or any of my other videos and want to see more content, then subscribing is the fastest and easiest way to be notified when new videos are posted and it also helps me plan future content and bring you guys more of what you want to watch. But with that out of the way, let's start talking about Bulldozer. All right. So I'm going to start by recommending you watch my simultaneous multi-threading video before you watch this video, because we're going to be building off a lot of concepts I brought up when discussing SMT, and it will also help to explain more of what I'll be discussing later in this video. But going off of architectural details and specs, all bulldozer-based CPUs, which includes its later derivatives of Piledriver, are built on a principle known as cluster multi-threading. This differs from simultaneous multi-threading, in the aspect that each quote-unquote thread isn't only sharing support systems to the core, and instead they're actually sharing computational circuitry, which severely limits the amount of instructions that are able to be carried out by each individual thread. Looking at a block diagram, you'll see that cores are grouped up in what AMD calls modules, and these modules each technically contain two processing cores. However, only integers are able to be simultaneously computed by the individual cores. If you want to get super technical, AMD is right when they say that the FX8350 has 8 cores. However, looking at the diagram, you can see that there are in fact 8 integer cores, with 2 sharing a single floating point unit and a scheduler. If we want to compare this to what I would consider a true 8 core CPU, in this case my i7-9700K, you'll see that each CPU core has its own dedicated integer cluster along with its own FPU and scheduler meaning that each core can operate independently of one another without having to share cycles with another core on the same scheduler. While this is more expensive to produce, the gains in performance more than make up for the increased die size, and it's also what AMD reverted back to with their Zen architectures. So even AMD has acknowledged that separating cores is superior, at least for an x86 chip. And this is why bulldozer cores underperform when individually stressed and perform rather well in multi-core workloads. To understand this a little more, say you're this program trying to execute these three lines of code. You'll see they're just simple addition operations, but there's a big distinction between the first line and the second line. So say you're a bulldozer module, and you have to execute these three computations. Because the first line is computing integers, you can execute the code on one of the two integer clusters available in your cores. So you can just run that relatively quickly and leave the other integer cluster open for operations. However, the second line of code is computing a floating point number, meaning that you have to execute it on the only FPU that you have. But that's not really too big of a deal since the third line goes back to computing integers, so you can just run the third line on the second inactive integer cluster. However, let's change the code to force the cores to compute three consecutive floating point operations and remove any integer calculations. You can probably see where I'm going with this, but because each bulldozer core has to share an FPU with another core, that means you aren't able to parallelize floating point calculations like you'd be able to with integers. 
This all adds up to my ultimate opinion about the FX series, and that's that these chips have the marketed core configuration when computing integers. However, only half the relative amount of computational die space is made available to floating point numbers, bottlenecking any operations to what's essentially half the total computational power available to computing integers. And if you watched my previous video about RDNA 2 and floating point math, you'll see that games require thousands if not millions of floating point calculations per second. And looking again at the block diagram, these chips just don't have the necessary horsepower that's needed to drive modern gaming. Well, yes, these chips are still all right for everyday desktop usage. If you're looking to game on your build in 2020, I would strongly recommend to avoid any of the FX series CPUs, along with chips built on their derivative architectures. While they may be cheap, their performance is ultimately incredibly disappointing. But I do have to say that I had a blast with my FX6300, when I built my first system back in 2016, and I'll always remember those chips with a little bit of fondness. So thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. I've been making a lot of super technical videos over the past few weeks, and I'm kind of curious as to what you guys think of them. Obviously I can cover other topics, and even change up how I present this technical information, but as of now, I'm really just curious as to what you guys think of this overall style and presentation format. But it was fun talking, and if you want to learn more about computer hardware or software, then the annotations on screen are a great place to start. Thanks for spending your time with me, and thanks for watching.